Welcome to the Social Engineer Podcast, the Doctor is In series. This is episode 193. I'm Chris Hadnagy, CEO and founder of Social Engineer LLC, the Innocent Lives Foundation, as well as the Institute for Social Engineering. And I've been hosting this podcast since way back in 2009. And as always, I am joined by the infamous, well-known, and very phd Dr. Abby Morano. Nice to have you, Abby. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I'm Dr. Abby Morano. I'm a behavioral scientist. Uh, the Director of Education at Social Engineer, a nonverbal communication coach, and a lecturer in psychology. I have a PhD in behavior analysis and psychology, and I specialize in nonverbal communication, trust, and the psychological mechanisms underpinning human decision making. And you got your PhD right this time. I didn't mess you up. Yes, I did. That's, I that's said really it right good. this time. I'm really happy about that. Thank you. <laughs> a few quick uh, housekeeping things before we get into our a really exciting uh, topic for today. If you're looking for anything to do with social engineering, we, you should check out our website, social-engineer.com. They're a sponsor for this episode of this show. You can check out things about vishing, fishing, smishing. I know those are all the ishings, but also we have our whole 2023 training schedule up there. We have a class in uh, January here in Orlando. We have an OSINT class and a brand new class that just came out called the Social Engineering Risk Assessment class. So you can go online, check out our schedule for that. Uh, read the descriptions of the courses. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. I'm more than happy to help you out. And if you're looking for a way to help secure your company and the people in your company from the attacks that we see all over the internet today, definitely check out the services that we offer and we'll be able to help secure your human side of your network. Okay, a few other quick things. If you love the topic of social engineering, you just want to talk about it all day long, you should join our Slack channel. We have a couple thousand people in there now. Well, maybe not that many. I think it's like 1,500 or so. And they're in there each and every day talking about all the different aspects of social engineering from the work side to the security side to the attack side to just trying to understand it if you're an enthusiast. We even have a group that gets together once a week and does practice sessions, if you can believe that. A job board on the Slack channel has helped, I think, about nine people now find different employment. So we're really excited about what's going on in there. If you want to join, you can see the, the link in the show notes down below, or you can hit me up on Twitter on Human Hacker, and I'll be more than happy to get you the link to join us there. It's a family-friendly channel, so if that sounds like you, come on in, and you can have a conversation with us. I also want to invite everyone who's listening to take a moment to go visit the Innocent Lives Foundation at innocentlivesfoundation.org. The nonprofit that we are working with over there, a uh, really amazing group of people. We're now um, up to about 500 cases that we've, that we've worked on, which means that we are helping law enforcement around the globe identify and locate people who are trafficking children and harming children by creating child abuse material. Uh, the, we, we don't use any vigilante methods uh, completely above the law. We help law enforcement locate them so they can be brought to justice. If you want to check out the work there and you want to support us either with donations uh, or with volunteering your time, you can do that all on the website, innocentlivesfoundation.org. And last but not least, uh, if you're listening to this podcast on one of the audio streaming services, then you are getting to hear the amazing sounds of the best rock and roll band, band on the planet, Clutch. They were nice enough to give us their music. Uh, as a opening and closing sounds for the show. So check them out at pro-rock.com. Neil Fallon's part of the ILF. So of course he's a big supporter and uh, we love those guys in that band. Okay. Now let's get to our topic, Abby. What are we talking about today? What amazing topic have you brought to the table for us today? Well, this topic was actually asked by one of our listeners and they messaged oh. me on Twitter asking for us to talk about this. So today we are talking about shame. Oh, that's interesting that somebody actually reached out to us asking for this topic. Um, I'm actually ex really happy that they did because I think this is one of those fascinating discussions that we don't often talk about. Not mean just you and me, like just I think in society in general, we don't talk about it. It's such a hard concept to understand. Um, so shame, let's first define it. What is it? Yeah. So uh, again, I mean, I was really excited about this topic because like you said people don't talk about it and shame itself is also um it's not difficult to define but it has many different definitions because it can occur in so many different ways but in general self um, shame is considered a self-conscious emotion it's a negative evaluation of oneself um due to one's behaviors or believing that you're not living up to your personal value system, um, or it can be due to um, 
environmental issues and upbringing. And for example, if you've had a really difficult childhood, that can bring a lot of shame as well. And people um, can be very shame prone because of other maladaptive um, psychological mechanisms. Um, So there's a lot here for us to unpack. And I, I think the reason that shame is so interesting is because we don't talk about it, like you said, but it it's deep rooted in every human society. You see it universally. Um, and it's one of our core emotions. It, it's an emotion that all of us have, yet it's the one that we are so resistant to talk about. And it's the one that really can cause the most damage to the self. Is there a positive side to shame? Because the things that, you know, you just said, it all makes it sound like, you know, my, my terrible childhood, my, my bad parents, uh, everything in my life that kind of stunk is why I have this. But why is, is there, a, is there a positive side to why shame could be good for us to have? Yeah. So, I mean, an eloquent phrasing, Chris. Of, <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, but so if anything's universal, I always ask myself, what's the purpose? Because if, anything is seen across the whole species it's evolved with us so evolution doesn't allow things that deter us to kind of stay long term so i always think what's its purpose and there's um, a writing called shame in self and society um, and it, it's a fantastic piece of work and it, it talks about the positives of shame and how shame really is our moral gyroscope so it alerts us to when our behaviors are morally or socially or otherwise reprehensible. So it basically signals that it's a threat to either ourself or to our social relationships. And there's a lot of research to back this up. For example, um, when we commit a moral transgression and it gives rise to feelings of shame, the person that's perpetrated that act is a lot more likely to engage in subsequent pro-social behaviours to basically attempt to make amends for that behaviour rather and compared to if they haven't felt shame. If they haven't felt shame, that motivation to make amends and to act pro-socially is is much lower. So I would imagine then, uh, based on that, that our belief system um, could affect what we feel shame for or, you know, what, however, and not just how we were raised, but whatever we believe in could, tr- could strongly affect, you know, our, that moral compass you said, and then could make us maybe not feel shame for certain things or feel more shame for something that someone else might not. So even though it's universal, the, per- the, the, um, the resultant of it or the reason that it happens is not universal. Yeah, absolutely. Because so shame is interesting because it's both social and personal. I think it's the emotion that is the most deeply social and the most deeply personal. Um, in terms of general culture and general society, shame maintains order because we don't act in a way that is morally reprehensible because of the shame to ourselves and to our social groups. But as you said, you know, that can vary across religions and cultures. And when you look at the core foundation of many religious groups, um, at the core of that is control. And it's control via shame, feeling shame for natural urges, feeling shame for who you love, what you think about, what you do, what you wear. And it's really, really, it's a powerful means of control. And when we take it from order, and then really make someone feel shame for things that they have no control over. It's a really strong means for control. Yeah, I was thinking about <clears throat> a conversation I was having with someone recently about um, like just the difference between Europeans and Americans in, let's say, swimwear and what would, you know, what would be considered normal or natural, like even just um, um, some nudity, let's say, which in America would be frowned upon or, or not, or there's special places for it where it's just commonplace in certain parts of the world. And um, it's that, let's say that compass or that guide that is yeah. socially acceptable. Say so you go to France and it's socially acceptable there. So people don't feel shame by it. And here yet there would be that feeling uh, in, th- in this part of the world because it's not socially acceptable. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why shame is, like I said, both personal and social, because we make our belief systems and our sense of right and wrong very culturally based. 
So your belief systems are going to be more US focused and mine are going to be more UK focused. So we might differ on certain things and then we compare that to non-Western cultures. Our belief systems are going to be very, very different. Um, so the things that cause us shame are going to be very different. Um, and when, when we talk about people that have no shame, it's never a positive. I think all we need to look at is when we say, you know, do they have no shame mm. to recognize that shame does serve some kind of function? Because if we're talking about someone having no shame, we're talking about them doing something that is reprehensible and they, they don't feel guilt and they don't feel embarrassment. And we would feel those things. So even just through that, it kind of lets us know that there is obviously something positive about shame or there's a reason that it, it works. Um, and shame can motivate us to not be selfish because we can, when we act selfishly, although it's in our best interest, one of the emotions that arises is shame. And again, research has found when we act selfishly and we feel shame, it encourages later less selfish behaviors. Whereas when we don't feel shame for those selfish behaviors, we're more likely to repeat that behavior. Yeah, I find it interesting when I think about, um, you know, growing up, let's say I'm going to go back 20, 30 years, you would never talk about seeing a therapist. Like if you saw a therapist, you were crazy. Like you went to a therapist, you were li- like, people would say, Oh, we must be crazy. There was no yeah. good reason to ever see a therapist. Right. And that societal, um, belief system made, I would imagine, um, I, I didn't experience this, but I would imagine it made a lot of people really feel shame or embarrassed if they're like, I really need to see a therapist. I'm having these problems or a doctor would suggest therapy, but you would do it in darkness and hiding because you didn't want people to find out and think you were, you were crazy. But now you jump forward to the, you know, era of, you know, the 2020s. And here we are and like not having a therapist almost seems like, well, what's wrong with you? Why, why don't you have a therapist? Right. And that has changed. And, and I was talking to a, a local therapist here in Orlando when, when COVID happened, um, depression rates went through the roof and they couldn't, they, they couldn't, uh, like they had to, they had to, their schedules were so full. There was no time off for them. There was no downtime. So it's just amazing to see like something like that, um, which before shame could have hindered someone from really seeking out proper help. But now that's changed and it's, it's more normal. Are there other ways that shame could create a situation where maybe someone doesn't get help for, for things that they might need that, that could be, that can help their, their life and their future? Yep. So shame can help us in many ways like we said but when we think about shame that's that's not the first thing that comes to mind we think about the pain that comes with that and we think you know it is it's difficult to describe shame because it is so painful um and it is so personal and everybody experiences it in the same way but it's so unique to each of us in the same respect um and it can stop people getting help because it's taboo because we don't want to talk about it. So instead of seeking help, we pretend that we don't have it. And when we hide from our shame, rather than seeking support, we don't just hide from the shame, we tend to withdraw altogether. And there's a lot of research, again, showing both from empirical studies and therapeutic observations, that one of the outcomes of shame is the tendency to withdraw. And this Mm. feeling of wanting to disappear and one of the things that is so painful about shame is it it creates this feeling of worthlessness so if you want to seek help and you think well i i really need some support if you feel worthless at the same time you're thinking well why why should i get support why does it matter who's going to help me and i don't deserve help anyway and shame can be so isolating in its feeling but also because it is taboo we hide ourselves away and then when we we physically isolate ourselves and it's already very psychologically isolating because even though each one of us feel it because no one talks about it when we feel it we feel like we're the only person in the world that feels it and that's psychologically isolating so we tend to then take ourselves out of our social relationships And we can't have these conversations with our friends or our family because we have this feeling, 
like a cloud over us. We can't engage in the normal conversations that we would. And then when we physically isolate ourselves, it can lead to depression and loneliness and poor sleep, cognitive impairments. And each of these things in themselves are really difficult for emotional coping as well as quality of life. And when we hide from shame in this way, shame doesn't go away. Mm. What it does, it, it just manifests. It manifests in the shape of denial because we want to say, I, I don't have shame. And when shame becomes this deep rooted and hidden, it doesn't stop affecting our behavior. All it does is stop us being aware that it affects our behavior. So we're acting unconsciously and that's a really dangerous place to be. So when we deny it, we then act in problematic ways because not only now are we escaping the thing that caused the pain and caused the shame, we're now escaping the feeling of shame itself as well without consciously realizing that that's what we're doing. Yeah, I once heard an analogy. Um, if you're ever in the kitchen or working on something in the house and you, you hit your finger with a hammer or you cut yourself, the first thing we do is I kind of grab it try to cover it, you know, protect it because it got hurt. But yeah. if you did that and you never, ever released it, you couldn't heal. You would just be here forever, lost, stuck. And it's kind of like what you were saying psychologically, if we do that, when we feel that shame, which is like kind of cover our, our brains and isolate it to, to protect yeah. it. But then we never step out of that. There's never a healing time. There's no way yeah. to, to get past that and, and seek that healing. Um, so I, I, I would imagine with that in mind is why it's so important to have the right group of friends or even a friend, someone yeah. that you can go to during those times that will not judge you and purely understand and be like, Hey, I'm feeling this right now. And maybe just be there to, to listen. Are there other advices that we can give for when, if someone is feeling that way and the way that they can kind of break that cycle so they don't just stay isolated? I mean, yeah, there's, there's some great coping methods. I just want to jump back to what you said before. Um, you said about hiding with the band-aid because there was something that I read that that it just jumped out at me um, at how protective human beings are. Like you said, we have this instant reaction. We hurt our finger, we grab it. And you don't even think about grabbing your finger. Your body just does it. Um, in response to trauma, and trauma can cause a lot of shame when we self-blame. You know, we think that it's my fault that this happened to me. And with severe shame from trauma, we see activation in, um, I mean, activation in the medial prefrontal cortex, in the anterior cingulate, the parietal cortex, and the insula. And these parts of the brain, they're important for processing the self and visceral feelings. Mm. So our bodily feelings, and then translating those into emotions. These parts of the brain that I just mentioned, particularly the medial prefrontal cortex and the insula, they are muted or reduced and sometimes completely muted in response to this feeling. So mm. what this is saying is when we feel so much shame as a response to trauma, particularly in PTSD, we literally shut off those brain regions that process our sense of self self-relevant information and our bodily sensations which we then turn into emotions because we literally are so protective rather than grabbing that hand and trying to cover it up we shut off brain regions to hide from it and that that's how protective we are with this sense of shame particularly like i said in response to things like trauma um, and i think it's just it it goes to show how powerful and isolating this emotion is because if you shut off those regions that process self-relevant information as well as process your connection to your bodily senses that's a very isolating and emotionally blunting place to be and that in itself then defers you from trying to seek support because you don't want to because you don't really feel anything anymore and that explains why <clears throat> when people do go through trauma, they have that numb feeling. Yes. You know, because it, like you said, it shuts off all those parts of the brain that actually make feeling. So they yeah. just sit there numb, which, yeah. uh, which creates inactivity in itself. 
Yeah. And it's called emotional blunting. And what we do is we take this thing that we've done or this thing that has happened to us and we put it in a box. We shut that box and put it to the side and we say, I don't want to feel this. And that can work short term, but then we have to open that box and deal with it. When we push it to the side, it doesn't just take that emotion and hide it. What it does is it takes a lot of our emotion and hides it. And then there's studies showing that when people do this emotional blunting strategy and this denial, it can create long-term emotional blunting, which is why people act in ways that isn't really them because they don't have their emotions driving us. And our emotions are so central to who we are. And you see people act out. You see these, you know, self-harming. Um, you see substance abuse. You see problem drinking. You see difficulty self-regulating emotions and self-regulating eating. And all of these things are really damaging. But it's also because they don't have their emotional systems working the same way that they should do. And you hear things like, you know, people will steal or people will commit really dangerous acts. And they, they say, I just want to feel something because they've shut off those emotional systems. Um, and the ironic thing is when we do that to avoid shame, we act in hmm. more ways that then later cause us shame yeah. when we don't deal with it. And it becomes this snowball effect when we try and avoid our shame without dealing with things. We lose our sense of self because we don't want to look at ourselves. And we we look at ourselves, but through this screen, because we're trying to protect ourselves. And when we do that, it's just that snowball. And we're not really acting in a way that is in our best interest and is conducive to our sense of self. Because the ball's going to keep rolling until we open that box. And when we open that box, we're going to have to deal with that mess at the end of it. So the earlier we open that box, the less that we're going to have to pick up but the harder it gets, because the more we do, the more shame we're then going to have to deal with at the end of it. And it it can be so easy to avoid looking at it because it seems like the comfortable thing to do. Because looking at yourself when the when shame is that emotion that will come to you and you have to open that box of things you've been hiding is very, very difficult. Um. And going to what you said about coping mechanisms, one thing that is very, very clear in the literature um, is people that have a lot of shame when they act in a way that isn't conducive of their sense of self, people that see that as a learning curve versus people that see it as a reflection of who they are, it's their cognitive appraisals. So when you look at a behavior and you say, I did a bad thing, very different than I am a bad person because I did this thing. And when you appraise it versus I did a bad thing and I feel guilt versus I am a bad person and I feel shame, we need to pull apart where guilt is appropriate and not shame because they're very, very different. But when you don't have a strong sense of who you are, and you, it's like if I said to you, Chris, you know, who are you? You would reach into your sense, your self concept, you know, not your achievements, not your career. Who are you? What, what is your sense of self? Knowing that it protects you because it gives you a strong self concept. If I don't know who I am, when I act in a way that is reprehensible, I can't look at my self-concept and say, well, they're not in line. I have a really strong sense of who I am. This doesn't match that. Therefore, I did a bad thing, but it's not reflective of me. And now I need to make amends. When you don't have that strong self-concept, the damage to your self-image can break down your identity and it can make you feel worthless because you haven't got anything to fall back on and say, well, this doesn't represent what I stand for because you don't know what you stand for. And that, again, can be a really isolating place. So do you think that makes the difference between why some people can seemingly cope with um, with the feelings of shame and others don't? Is that those who can cope have a stronger uh, understanding of themselves and self-identity as opposed to those who don't may not have that, that strong sense of self? 
Yep. So it's one of the reasons. So a strong self-concept is a really strong protective factor for shame. Because like I said, you can look at yourself and say, oh, I did a bad thing. You know, all human beings have done bad things. And when you have a strong sense of self and you look at your cognitive appraisals of I did a bad thing, I'm not a bad person, you recognize, you know, growth is through mistakes. If you don't make mistakes, you don't grow. No person is entirely good nor entirely bad. Good people do bad things. Bad people do good things. And when we are suffering through trauma, especially, our brain doesn't work like it normally does. Regions of our brain shut down. Others are overactive. Our emotional systems go AWOL. We struggle with our prefrontal cortex. And when our brain is having these crazy wiring patterns in a means to try and protect us, of course, we're not going to act in a way that is necessarily conducive to our sense of self. And we have to practice self-forgiveness and kind of recognize that I was going through a difficult period and I definitely wasn't myself. I know who I am now. I didn't know who I was then. So how I acted doesn't support who I am. So I now want to make amends for that and I want to move forward and learn from it. Uh, But also a strong social self. So a, a lack of social identity is a risk factor for um, the negative effects of shame um, because uh, our social selves are nearly as important as our, our sense of self. Because when you think about who you are, most of that is defined by your relationships with other people, more so in collectivist cultures than Western cultures. But a, a strong sense of who we are, like I would strongly define myself by my relationship with my dad. Um, if I didn't have my relationship with my dad, I wouldn't know hmm. who I, I who I am as much. And that is a big part of me. And people who are married, I'm sure they could say that their partner is a huge sense of who they are. And those relationships protect us from those negative effects of shame. But shame is also affected by general maladaptive psychological mechanisms so if you are realizing that you are shame prone and you feel shame and you're not able to deal with it in a correct way shame isn't necessarily the problem shame is a symptom Mm. of the problem because you should be able to see it and deal with it and we know that uh, maladaptive psychological mechanisms will stop us from being able to do that for example, it's more common for to see shame proneness in people with low self-esteem. So before you can work on the shame, you need to work on the self-esteem. Also, people with social dysfunction. Before you work on the shame, you need to work on the social dysfunction. Same with a lot of mental health disorders. It's not the shame that's the problem. The shame is the symptom of the problem. So a lot of the time, shame, when you're not able to process it, is a signal to you that something else is going on and you need a bit more support with that. And I think if you are seeing in that respect, that's when it's time to get professional help. And that's when it's time to really reach out to your social networks. So that's an interesting um, thought. I know when um, I started getting healthy, one of the concepts uh, was making sure that uh, you don't want to get rid of your friends, of course, but make sure that you add to your group of friends, (laughs) people who are also on the same journey, because that, yeah, support group motivates you to keep going. If you just, you know, stay with the same group that maybe are unhealthy, then you may fall back into those old bad habits. So how would someone who's um, maybe going through this or suffering with this, how do you find a support network that, you know, because I think we're attracted to people who are like us um, and that can be very dangerous in this situation. Like you said, it sounded like a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're constantly Mm -hmm. going in this circle that never gets out of it. So how does someone find a support network that that could help them if they're experiencing these problems that we're talking about? I mean, if you are looking for a particular support network, but like you said, you you don't fully know who you are yet. Um, I think going to help groups is a really good place to be, um, because if you're in that kind of mindset, it's very easy to reach out to the wrong kind of people. You know, if you're doing maladaptive behaviors, um, and you're, you're drinking or you're taking substances. So you're going to say, okay, well, this person knows what I'm going through. So I'm going to work through it with this person. That might not be the healthiest relationship for you. 
to be with someone that's suffering with the same thing. In other circumstances, for example, after trauma, particularly things like sexual abuse, being in those specific help groups is extremely important to be around people that are dealing with exactly the same thing as you, because it can feel like no one in the world understands what you're going through. And then when you're with a group of people that have gone through that same thing, it's very validating. Um, so I would say the first thing is to work on yourself. We know that not understanding the self and a lack of self-concept really is the, the core of shame. Mm. Um, and having self-knowledge and practicing self-reflection is essential. For example, mindfulness. And I've always been a little bit weary of mindfulness because mm. I'm not spiritual at all. I'm not anti-spiritual, but it's just never been anything that appeals to me. I, I'm very skeptical being a scientist. So I felt mindfulness is very like woohoo kind of, <laughs> you know, everything's going to be okay if we just sit and breathe. But looking into shame and looking into self-awareness, I couldn't ignore mindfulness anymore because there's a lot of neuroscience research. Um, and mindfulness isn't about kind of switching off from the world and disengaging. It's about being present in the present moment and feeling your breathing. And instead of when you feel an emotion and you don't know if you're angry or you're enraged or you're furious or you're scared, it's about connecting with your bodily senses. And there was research on mindfulness of an eight week uh, mindfulness training. Um, and after the eight weeks, they saw um, the gray matter concentration in the left hippocampus was bigger. Um, there were also changes in brain structures that are essential to cognitive processes like learning and memory, as well as emotional regulation, self-reflection, self-examination, including, I talked about the insula and the medial prefrontal cortex. Those brain areas were kind of brought back on track through mindfulness, pro through mindfulness practice. So what it does is it helps us connect with our sense of self again. So when we shut down that not wanting to look at ourselves, when we do it in this practice of mindfulness, which is a non-judgmental approach, it helps us re-engage with ourselves and those brain areas, as well as connect with our body. So I think those kinds of caring techniques, when you show yourself care, you show yourself love and show yourself compassion, they are really conducive to this self-knowledge because that's where you want to get you want to get to a point where you know yourself enough that when you behave in a certain way and we're all going to do it we all say i'm never going to do that again and <laughs> we're all human beings we all have desires and we all make mistakes and we are all cognitively flawed we are all going to have shame it's about knowing who you are now that that act doesn't define you and you can define you and you know when You've behaved in a way that's a bad behavior, not a bad person. Mindfulness practice, strong social support, strong sense of self, recognizing your cognitive appraisals. If you say, I'm a terrible person, and sometimes speaking to a friend and you're talking about your shame, <laughs> you can notice your cognitive appraisals. You're saying, I'm, I'm such an awful person. I'm so stupid and worthless. You know, I, I didn't, I don't deserve anything good. Sometimes it takes them to say, hey, listen to what you're saying you're you're placing the blame on you on your sense of self not on your actions and that is a big indicator okay well i need to actually think about it you're right this doesn't define me it, i'm smirking because <clears throat> you and i are opposite in in some things but really similar in others like uh you know i am a very spiritual person but i, I also didn't really fall into the mindfulness portion until um just going through a really really stressful circumstance and i had uh, my trainer actually started talking about doing these breathing exercises and i was just like come on like how the heck is breathing gonna fix anything like i breathe in right now <laughs> and i still have stress right and and it wasn't until i went through this one exercise with uh believe it or not they have these people breathing coach yeah. and i was like what the heck like 
it actually reduced all, it, it took away stress. It made me, and what I found for me, <clears throat> exactly what you said, that there was moments now where I'm sitting there and during the normal day, I'm thinking about a million things, but let's say that stress is always in the background. So I'm not spending time trying to understand it or put it in its proper box. It's just there like this cloud over everything else that you're doing. Now you go through this exercise and for those moments, you can just completely focus. You can not have the millions of other things happening and the ability to kind of work out uh, stressful or shameful or other circumstances during that that exercise, I found that to be quite uh, fascinating. And I wanted, yeah. I was going to use the word revolutionary, but that's probably the wrong word, but it was going to be fascinating. No, because... I mean, I, I agree completely. <laughs> yeah. It's weird, and, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's like PTSD is quite effectively um, dealt with through yoga because mm. yoga and mindfulness yoga is very effective because think about our emotions. They sit within our nervous system. You know, they sit within our body. And when we decide what we feel, we make a judgment based on our circumstance, as well as how do we feel in our body. The insula is this unbelievable structure in the brain that allows us to connect our physical sensations, our visceral senses to our emotional experience. When we don't know how to do that, we don't know what our body is telling us. Mindfulness practice, connecting with breathing, um, these mindfulness yoga, as well as just sitting and being present and focusing, they connect us with our bodily sensations and they light up the insula. And that is so important because if we don't understand how we feel, we're not going to act appropriately. We can only act and say, okay, well, actually, I don't feel angry. I feel hurt. I was going to act out in anger, but I sat, I connected with mm -hmm. myself and I realized there's actually something underneath that. Because my body isn't saying anger. It's saying something different. I just wasn't listening to it. Yeah. And it's very difficult to do because we just want to act. We don't <laughs> want to look at ourselves because it causes shame. And it's tough. It's so hard to look at things that cause you shame. And it's so easy to shut that box. And the longer that box is shut, the more we don't want to open it. But the bigger it gets inside. And the less yeah. we're going to act in a way that we can be proud of you know you want to look back and think i was really proud of how i acted and you can't do that unless you are fully you unless you are fully connected with your sense of self and i think mindfulness is such a beautiful way to do that um but just uh going about uh going back to social groups check your social environment mm. because a lot of the time our social environment is causing us shame. If we are struggling, it's very easy for people to feast on that um, and people to see someone who is struggling, see someone who is weak and use that as a means of control and think about what causes you shame. Try and pinpoint what causes you shame and think, is it this conversation I had with someone? You know, I remember being in a relationship and I kept feeling really awful about myself and when I would think, well, why do I feel this way? I remember my sister saying, well, every time you say you're unhappy about something, your hmm. partner would pick up on that and judge you for it, would make fun of that thing. And he had nicknames for my insecurities and would laugh hmm. about them. And then you realize, oh, well, this is why I feel shame. And then you remove that person yeah. from your life. You take them out and then you suddenly start to feel so much better about yourself. So our environments can be conducive of healing, but also can be the reason for our shame a lot of the time. It's a lot to balance, right? Because, you know, like you said in the beginning, on one mm -hmm. hand, um, shame motivates us to make sure uh, for some of us that have consciences and things that we're not doing things that can be harmful to society or others or our families or ourselves. On the second hand, shame can be weaponized and can be used yeah. as a control mechanism. Um, I think today, on the internet, it's obvious that people love to see others' weaknesses. Uh, bullying is at an all-time high. And mm -hmm. I was just reading this horrific article about um, the number of suicides that occur because of online bullying. And you would yeah. think about, I, I think about those things and it just, it's, it's horrifically fascinating and not in a good way because you, you think about, man, I know we all went through bullying in school. But now it's just so much to the point that like, why well, knew when I went home, when I got off that bus, it was done, right? I didn't have to be yeah. bullied anymore. 
But now you're followed around 24 seven with your phone on social media and people can bully you nonstop. They can say yeah. horrific things about you nonstop. And then you see these stories where they're encouraging the person. You should just go kill yourself. And that yeah. level of shame, obviously, that's not healthy at all. So <clears throat> trying to balance those things, I think it's great um, idea. What you said is like um, I was thinking someone may be listening to this and saying, well, how do I even find a good therapist? Um, one suggestion I have is on the website Psychology Today. Um, and it's not just for America. There's, I think, like 26 different countries there if where if depending on where you live that you can change the country and you can find a therapist in your country and they list all different things like what types of matters do they deal with? And you can check boxes. You know, you can see this is my stressors. This is what I'm feeling and therapists that specialize in that. Um, you know, there, there's there's places out there where people can find help uh, if they're looking for it to cope with these things. Um, and then, and then looking for some, um, breathing classes, which I know sounds so weird, but I'm part of this group now where they do, it's just, it's just a weird <laughs> concept, but it works so well. It's unbelievable. And I have a buddy who was, um, went through the, um, the Wim Hof, uh, method. Uh, he, he, and he swears by it. And he's like, it's amazing. You wake up in the morning and you do this exercise and it's like, he feels more clear. And he goes, I don't know if it's, fake if it's pseudo or whatever he goes but i'm doing it because it works and i don't care and he's like it's amazing how well it works so there's some good tips at least for people who may be struggling on the wrong side of this this battle and things like sports classes because mm. sports particularly yoga is so good for healing and sports can be used as a coping mechanism to avoid dealing with it so don't do that do it in the other way um but yoga classes because you get the social support too and if you have a hobby rather than just learning at home learning a class because be around people that do things that you like and i mean there's also um like websites where it's not a dating site but it's like a friend finding site because it's really difficult for a lot of people that work particularly work virtually to meet friends there's no shame in (laughs) looking for friends online you know, whether it's via a friend or a friend meeting app or friend meeting um, class or a dating site or sports class, however works for you, putting yourself in a social class is a great coping mechanism as long as at the same time you are dealing in yourself because nothing is going to change unless you change. Shame is one of those things that no one can make it go away for you. It will never, ever go away unless you look at it. Mm. It just won't. It's always going to be there unless you face it. It's so hard to do so. So if you need a good support network so you are able to do that, then that's what you should do. And like Chris said, you know, there's there's no shame in (laughs) shame. You know, don't be ashamed of shame. Yeah. Embrace it. Embrace the fact that we are flawed and embrace the fact that feeling shame means you're not a psychopath and <laughs> you're not a sociopath. You care. You care what other people think about you and you want to be better. And if, and if, um, with that last piece of advice, if you're a young person listening to this, a minor, just some tips to stay safe, because I know during COVID, a lot of websites popped up to help find friends online. Um, if if someone online starts asking you for information or pictures or things that just seem inappropriate, uh, even though they may say they're the same age as you and they may be struggling with the same struggles you have, uh, don't don't feel pressure to send things to people that you don't know well online ever. And uh, and if you do, I know that um, uh, people who exploit children. Uh, use shame. They use shame to do that. So they'll, yeah. they'll, they'll get you to send something and then they'll tell you that they're going to humiliate you if you don't comply with more requests. So, uh, many of the young people that we've worked with at, at ILF that we've helped through things like that or because they were able to put that shame aside, that potential embarrassment and seek help and go to their parents and their parents would come to us and then we'd be able to find the people that were doing that to them. That could be a very difficult thing, but I think it's a really important topic on this is that um, yeah. ch- child exploitation, child exploiters use shame to get uh, compliance out of their victims. So if you are dealing with that, 
uh, talk to somebody, talk to your parents, talk to a trusted adult, uh, go to innocentlivesfoundation.org, report it, uh, report it to Nick Mick, uh, the police, whatever you need to do. And yeah, it may be embarrassing at first, but um, the the result of not fixing that could be that someone will exploit you over and over and over again. So uh, I'm, I'm a big proponent of, you know, using these online sites and, and seeking out help. Uh, I know there's a lot of really great ones out there. Uh, just during COVID, there was a wonderful group of teachers that got together um, that realized that homeschool was not conducive for a lot of young people. So they put together homework uh, work sites where someone who's like, let's say, an algebra two that was struggling can come in and there'd be a teacher in this chat room and a bunch of other kids and they kind of helped each other. So what a wonder. And it was free. It was a free site. They put it together. What a wonderful thing for teachers to do. Uh, to be able to, to do that. Of course, you still got to be careful on those sites because, um, you know, there'll be people who are, have no shame that will be on there trying to exploit other people. But I'm all big for those sites because I think that's a really great way to, to kind of get out there and meet new people and meet people from different cultures and different parts of the country or the world and learn about their cultures. That's always fascinating to me. When I was a kid, we only could do that through pen pals. I remember having a pen pal and you'd write a letter and you'd wait a month and maybe they would write one back, you know. And I think I had a pen pal. <laughs> Did you really? I was really young, yeah. Well. And social media has not actually been around for that long. Yeah. I do remember going on holiday and having a pen pal when I was really young. It's good, a cool thing, right? I remember writing letters <laughs> to, to my pen pal and it was like really, really interesting to have that and to me- talk about cultures. Then you'd send a picture back and forth and now you can do that in minutes as opposed to waiting a month. You know, I, I can't yeah. remember. I think it was Pakistan or somewhere my pen pal was. And you wait fo- so long for the letters back and forth, you know. <laughs> and it was a program in school that like a school here and where I was in New York would uh, partner with a school in Pakistan and kids would, you know, all of our pictures would be on their wall. Their pictures would be and you'd pick your pen pal and then you'd start writing. And it yeah. was just a cool little program. And I learned all this stuff about uh, Middle Eastern culture and food and clothing and things like that. And yeah, I just I found that fascinating. And now you can do that so much easier. You don't have to mm-hmm. wait months. So, yeah, some great suggestions. Uh, Abby, and hopefully it will help people. I think probably especially now with everything that's going on in the world, this is a more common problem uh, that's that's turning into a bigger problem than 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 before. So hopefully yeah. this will be good information for those listening. So. Any closing comments or any, um, I know we, you, you prepared, Abby prepared. I'm looking at this. It looks like maybe 15 or so research papers that she looked up on all of these different things that these will be in the show notes. So, um, the, the, the names of the papers. And if you have access to research, uh, because of your university or college or someplace like that, you can find these. Some of them you can just find online by searching. Uh, but if you're interested in this topic and learning more about it, all of those things will be in, in the show notes. And um, thanks for having another fascinating topic today, Abby. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. And uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. Next month, we'll be discussing information elicitation. Man, we jump around these topics. There's like no rhyme or reason. No no, rhyme or reason. We just talked about not giving information out. And next week, we're going to talk about how to get information. How to get information out of people. (laughs) That is great. Okay, well, join us next month, and we'll see what we can find out then. Till then, see ya.